and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling games from November 1988. I sweet-talk my Spectrum. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with some hardware. But first, the news. The news this month in all of the magazines was more or less taken up completely by the huge PC show at Earl's Court in London. Many Spectrum Games publishers were there, including Damark showing off their spitting image game, Dynamic with Game Over 2, and Ocean with Operation Wolf and Robocop. Sinclair were showing off their new computer, sadly not Spectrum compatible as many had hoped, but the PC200 is aimed at the smaller business or home user and it's supposed to be competition for Amstrad's similar targeted machines. Staying with the PC show, and there was the final of the National Computer Championships. There were six finalists on the Spectrum, and six on the Commodore, and the whole contest began in April, with heats taking place across the country. Now, these finalists would battle it out on a new game, Road Blasters from US Gold, to see who was the best. The eventual Spectrum winner was Stuart Campbell, with Mark Young winning the Commodore section. Both received £1,000 worth of software for their efforts. Both players then played against each other to see who was the ultimate champion, and again a new game was used, Mad Mix. The eventual winner was Mark. It was filmed for television, so if anyone knows where this footage can be found, it would be very interesting to see. Mediagenic are taking the leap into television advertising, and putting out over 36 ads on Saturday morning this month. They are mainly focused on their latest big name games such as Afterburner, R-Type and SDI. This new expensive trend may make them a whole heap of cash, or it may backfire totally as television advertising is rarely used for games. And that was the news, and now on to the top 5 games. At number 5 is Tracksuit Manager from Goliath. At number 4, where time stood still from Ocean. At 3, Target Renegade from Imagine. At number 2, Road Blasters from US Gold. And at number 1, Football Manager 2 from Addictive. And that was the news and top selling games from November 1988. Way back in the mist of time, I reviewed the Karar Microspeech, a hardware interface that allowed your spectrum to talk. Cheetah's answer to that is their own unit, the Cheetah Sweet Talker. The two units look different, with the Kura unit being thin and light, and the Cheetah being much bigger and heavier. The reason for the extra weight is the built-in large speaker at the back. Once connected, it's time to chat with your computer. I usually use my Spectrum Plus for hardware reviews. However, when I tried to plug the interface in, it didn't fit properly. The shape has been notched out specifically for the 48K rubber keyed model. So I switched to that machine instead and hoped it wouldn't blow it up. As you can see, it fits much better. The Karai unit worked by interpreting the words in the string, and you could emphasise things like adding extra E's and capital letters. The Sweet Talker though is different. The software uses sounds to produce words, and to get this you have to enter data statements into your program. This takes much longer than the Karai unit, but supposedly gives better results. One thing's for sure, that speaker is loud, wow. Sadly though, it doesn't output game sounds, which is a bit of a missed opportunity really. If you get the data statements wrong, or try to mix multiple data statements together, things can get a bit dodgy. The only way to silence this is to send an out command to channel 7 with a pause. The interface comes with a tape, 
on which is a program called Chatbox. This is just a demo that talks through various screens of text. Shows you an example bit of code and then tries to sell you some more cheetah products. You can't blame them for trying, I suppose. The speech, I think, is better than the Kara produces, with more options to get words just right, and the added speaker makes it better if a lesser known option. The device does have a pass through port, which is a good feature, and overall, this is a nice unit if you want to produce speech. It didn't sell in large numbers though, and the game support was very limited. In fact, I can't find any that actually used it, unlike the Curar. Overall then, a nice device that produces acceptable results, but something to mess about with only really, it's just a bit of fun. Originally released in the arcade by Irem in 1987, R-Type was an instant hit. This side-scrolling shooter had many features including large detailed levels, a charge shot that could be activated by holding down the fire key to produce a more powerful blast, and a pod or outrider that can attach to the front of the player's ship. Not to mention the multiple types of weapons your ship could be upgraded with. This game is noted as being very difficult to play, as each level had to be memorised for success. This was quickly ported to many systems, with the Spectrum version being acclaimed as one of the best. Yes, this is a Spectrum conversion that was superb, but very hard. The impressive title screen leads the player to this excellent shooter. The detailed and colourful landscape scrolls smoothly, and then a barrage of aliens, all multicoloured, advance towards you. This 1 to 8K game features some great sound effects and gameplay, but you will need to practice a lot to get very far. Like the arcade version, you can charge your beam by holding down the fire key to produce a more powerful shot, and this comes in useful for those tougher enemies. If you get far enough, your little pod becomes available, and this adds several elements to the gameplay. You can use it as a shield and crash into the enemies, you can increase your firepower by having firing missiles or lasers, or you can fire it forwards to destroy the enemies. It isn't long before the screen gets full of fast moving things, and it's a real task to get past them. There's also ground based enemies, and like the others, they fire almost continuously at times. Eventually the scenery will change and a whole new impressive background scrolls into view. This is one tough game to get through, well at least it was for me, and I had to use pokes to see most of the levels. More weapons become available the further you get, including the diagonal bouncing lasers and the multicoloured round things I've no idea what they're called. And with all this on screen, I'm amazed that the game speed doesn't suffer. A masterful bit of coding. You can also upgrade your pod and get additional outriders. Yes, it's all in here, and yes, there are massive end bosses too. There are multiple levels, loaded from tape, and each has new scenery and challenges. I could never get this far, so again, most of this footage was grabbed using immunity pokes. I love shooters, and I love R-Type, and it's a brilliant conversion, but I'm rubbish at it. This doesn't stop me from trying it though, it's a great game.
This is Kai Temple from Firebird, released in 1986. Yes, another ninja game from Firebird. Ooh, haven't we had enough of them by now? You are trapped inside a Kai Temple and have to escape. To get out, you have to get past ninjas and divas. What female singers? What are they doing in a Kai Temple? Divas can only be killed with a knife, and ninjas have to be fought hand to hand, foot to head, or fist to groin. You get the idea. There are also flying swords and a time limit. On to the game then. The screen has three platforms that you can move up or down onto. Here are the ninjas, I presume. What a terrible death sound. Dead again. Well, I managed to get one at least. Why have I just been flipped upside down? Ugh. I see this in a similar vein to all the other ninja games Firebird pushed out. If you kill the first one, you get to fight two, unless you run out of time. And if you beat two, you get to fight three. So you run about, wait until the very last minute, and then kick them in the nuts. Ugh, dead again. Once you get past the screen with three ninjas, you get on another screen where you have to hit a bell. This involves pounding the punch key until the power meter goes up, and then randomly you drop down onto a seesaw. Hmm, ninjas are famous for their seesaw skills. If you fail this, which I always did, it's back to the three ninjas again. The graphics are ooh, okay, I suppose they're nothing special, and sound is average. Apart from that death sound, which really does get annoying. Gameplay is dull, and you have to be very precise about your proximity to the ninjas before you kick them. There's an exit door at the bottom, but it doesn't seem to do anything. Really, it should exit the game and reset the machine, and I suspect most players will head for that straight away after just playing one or two games. This is a terrible game. I see no enjoyment at all here. <sighs> Time to move along. This is Formula One Simulator, released by Mastertronic in 1985. This game was originally published by Spirit Software a year previously, complete with a plastic steering wheel that you placed on your keyboard to steer. Mastertronic got rid of that, added a better loading screen, and allowed you to control the game via the keyboard or various joysticks. The game has a nice selection of tracks to race on, including the usual Silverstone, Brands Hatch and Monaco. Once you've chosen a track, you can choose automatic or manual gears, and wet or dry conditions. You can then specify whether you want to practice or qualify. I had done a few practice laps already, so I opted to qualify. The track is empty, and I don't just mean other cars. I mean no verge, no roadside objects, no clouds, no hills, nothing. The car itself is a static image. Nothing moves. The wheels don't animate, your hands don't move, there's no dials, and the mirrors are a complete waste of time. Although when or if you eventually overtake, a little car will appear in them. Control is not too bad once you get over the dullness of the tracks. You break into the corners and there's some nice engine noises going on, as well as skidding sounds if you overcook it a bit. Going off the track too far will result in you crashing out. No second attempts in this game.
Once you qualify, it's time to race some opponents. They all drive green cars though, at least until they get closer, and then they all turn black. The track is very crowded, and overtaking is almost impossible. Maybe I was too eager. I either crashed off the track or into another car. The obvious selling point of this game was the plastic steering wheel, and with that gone, this is just a poor man's pole position, really. An average game, and if anyone has that steering wheel, I'd love to try it out and see if it improves the game, although I very much doubt it will. This is Twinlight, released by Retro Souls in 2017. Anyone who has played Deflector on the 16-bit machines will be familiar with the concept of this game. Using a series of mirrors, you have to guide the beam to complete each level. Once you get to know how the beam, or in later levels, beams, react with each mirror, it's then just a matter of working out which one to place in which position to get the desired result. To move the mirrors, you move your cursor over them and press fire. This picks them up. You can then position the mirrors over the beam and press fire again to drop them and see the result. You have to be careful. If you direct the beam back on itself, it's the end of the level, and you have to try again. Some levels have additional tasks, for example destroying all the pods before you can finally deflect the beam to its end point, and the end points are those flashing blocks. The graphics are chunky and colourful, and suit the game style, and the music that plays along is excellent. It's no surprise to find the code of this game was done by Denis Grouchev, a coder who's produced some excellent games for the machine. This puzzler is excellent, and certainly challenges your brain as the game progresses. A well presented, well produced game that's definitely worth checking out. Here we have a very early game from Spectrum Games, who went on to become Ocean Software. This is Monster Muncher, released in 1983. The game though didn't make it into Ocean's catalogue later on. I think you can tell from the name of the game and the inlay what type of game it is, so let's get into it. Yes, it's a Pac-Man clone but the instructions claim you have to eat apples and avoid monsters. The graphics are large, larger than normal Pac-Man clones from this era, that usually use 8 pixel blocks. However, the movement is still in jumps. The maze is green and black, rather than the familiar black and blue of the arcade. And the monsters, yes, they look like ghosts. And that yellow thing you control, yes, it's a Pac-Man. When you eat a power pill or collide with a monster, the screen flashes, which is unnecessary really. 
Sound is okay, but even though it's a machine code game, the sound consists of various beeps rather than nice effects. Control is a little sticky too. Sometimes a key press is not recognised for about half a second, which can mean the difference between you escaping or being killed by a ghost. Oops, sorry I meant monster. There are different difficulty levels too. This is level 0. Let's have a look at level 9. Blimey, that's a lot faster, and there are a lot more monsters. In fact, too many. Gameplay is okay on easy levels, and completing a maze can be done on the first try if you're really careful. Presentation leaves a lot to be desired, with just bland text explaining the controls. This game was sent to the show by David, and yes, he does want it back. So this is your section. You you wanted to speak about emulators and emulation. Now I think that's a really important part of the of the scene and the hobby, isn't it? I, I think we owe a lot of gratitude to all the people who've written different emulators over the years. As I say, my first one was is a PJPP or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, this two, this this JPP and then this PJPP. The only difference is PJPP has got an option to slow it down for faster machines, more modern machines. Yeah, and one was free and you had to pay for the other and you, the other arrived on a disc. I actually sent away a cheque, I think, for however much it was, five or ten pounds or something, and received in the post this disc with both, sloppy disc with both emulators on it. And I used I used that for years. I just used that for years and years and years. Didn't look at any others. Now I'll use Spectaculator. Yeah, I always yeah. use Spectaculator now. I'll use Fuse a little bit. If I'm messing around on a Raspberry Pi and just tinkering with a Raspberry Pi and trying to get stuff to work on there, I'll use Fuse on there. Another one I really like is Spin. It's like oh. Spin. I don't know if you've ever played that. That's a free one. And I downloaded that when I stopped using DOS emulators and moved to Windows. When I got my first XP machine, I went, I'm either going to need to use DOSBox or get a new emulator. Well, that's really odd because I've taken a completely different route through the emulators. I started off with Z80, and like you, I actually paid the money to get the licensed version of it. Yeah. From that, I also then moved on to X128, which is really good DOS emulator. Mm. And then when Windows came along, I moved to WinZX32 okay. uh, for Windows. So completely different to, to, to what you were using. Do you use Spectaculator, by the way? I don't. I do. Yes, I, I bought it when it was uh, a sale on one point. You could buy it for a fiver, so I, I waded in and bought it. It's my, my emulator of choice, unless I, unless it doesn't support something that I'm trying to look at, you know, like Spectranet or, or something like that, where I, the, the other emulators have, have got the built-in mm. uh, functionality. Don't think there's one emulator that's got everything. There was a point where they were all vying to be the best emulator and they were all vying to be the, the most accurate emulator and, and yeah. support the most hardware, but there isn't one that does everything, which is it's a bit of a shame, really, because you keep having to jump about, but I suppose it's you know it's good for competition. Well, one thing that I'd like that I've never been able to find is one that supports different key, joystick to key, key mappings for different games. If you play an Attic Attack, you could put it on Kempson joystick, but you need to map another button to Symbol Shift for the pickup. Yeah. Then you go to another game, and remaining on symbol shift for the pickup isn't good. So you want to map it to somewhere else. And I haven't found a PC DOS or Windows emulator that allows you to have just save and then auto load the key mappings. I'm I'm actually surprised no one's thought of it. That would be on my wish list. And if anyone knows, if anyone's listened to this and knows of one, please uh, put the put a comment <laughs> in the comment section. Um, so what things do you find are missing? I, I actually find Spectaculator's got nearly everything I need. Spectaculator hasn't got wafer. I don't think anything's got wafer drive support. Ah. The one that really bugged me was light guns. At yeah. one point, I, I said, no no emulator has got light gun emulation. And somebody said, yes, spin has. So I went in, and sure enough, there's a button to, to check, but I can't get it to work. You can get the cursor moving, and you can press the fire button to start the game, but it doesn't mm. actually then carry on and fire. I've never tried that. 
I like like gun games, but I don't ever think there were any for the Spectrum that were really particularly good. I mean, Operation Wolf's the one I always think of. If you're gonna if you're gonna play a game with a a light gun, op Operation Wolf would be the one you want yeah. to play. Well, there's one called Jungle Fever that I think comes with a Defender light gun, which is basically Operation Wolf. So, uh, do you find yourself moving more into emulation or away from emulation? I think emulation kept our hobby going. So I think it was emulation that kept me interested in the Spectrum. When I got PJPP and was playing the old games on that, I I really liked it. It kept my interest in the Spectrum alive. Now, I do like to play things on original hardware. I was hmm. playing Rex on my Plus 3, and I played it a lot on emulation. I really like Rex. It's a very, very good game. And I played it a lot on emulation, and... Playing it on the Plus 3, I was slightly surprised. The random number generator must be different on the real hardware. Because the things that happened didn't seem to happen in the same way. And it was actually easier on the Plus 3. Now, maybe maybe it was just it was just my imagination. But it definitely seemed to be easier on the Plus 3 than it was on the original. Sorry, than it is on an emulator. Hmm. Well, yeah. I, have, I have noticed with games that purport that they have random things, like random maze generators and things, when you load yeah. them on an emulator, they, it's usually the same maze every time you load it the first time, and then it produces a random one the second time it runs. Now, I don't know if it's something to do with timings or... Hmm. I, I, I agree. I, I think there are things in games that, on an, on an emulator, the, the random whatever it is isn't 100%. I am, I am getting more into modern hardware. I think I've heard many times people saying there's nothing really like playing it on, on the original hardware. Sorry, the original hardware. And I think that's right. I do I do like to play. I'm, I'm using, I've got a rubber key 48k and, a, and my plus three that are set up on my desk. Inspired by you, Paul. Uh, you shouldn't just set up on, your, uh, on the show. I agree. I think there is a difference between playing it on real hardware and emulation. Um, yes, I, I think it's better on real hardware. Real hardware all the way, I think. Putting things like the Div IDE onto the old hardware adds something else to it. You've got modern devices, as we've already talked about, that you can put onto the original hardware and play the games as they were intended. Back in episode 21, I did a feature on Sinclair's Interface 2. I noted that there were several other companies also producing interfaces that had ROM slots, including RAM Electronics with their RAM interface. The other contender was Kempston, with their impressively marketed Kempston Pro interface. This neat little box plugs into the back of your Spectrum, and gives you not only the ability to play ROM games, but also has three joystick ports. The left hand one is for Kempston or Cursor joysticks, the middle one is for Sinclair's 1 to 5 key joystick, and the right hand one is for Sinclair's 6 to 0 key joystick. Most bases covered there then. Once plugged in, you grab a cartridge of your choice, pop it into the top, and turn on your spectrum. Like the Sinclair and RAM versions, there's no power button, and like the Sinclair version, there is no reset button. This means you could easily break the machine by pulling out or pushing in a cartridge while the machine is on. Kempston took Sinclair's basic interface and added multiple joystick ports, and that's it really, but it was enough to make sure that the interface is probably the best of the three. It does what it was designed to do, looks nice, is easy to use, and was competitively priced. A nice but short-lived bit of kit then, let down only by the lack of games on cartridge.